I watched a manufacturer's video on Carrier the other day, and they were talking about cleaning condenser coils, and they said nothing. Well, it was a manufacturer's representative, like a distributor that does YouTube videos, and they didn't say anything about splitting a coil. And I think that's something that manufacturers don't do a good job of letting people know because you read installation instructions and it says, oh yeah, just clean it, you know, no big deal. Real short, ice machine manufacturers do that too. They say, oh yeah, our machines only take this much time to clean. It's a lot of baloney because realistically, probably once to twice a year, this condenser needs to be split like this and cleaned. This video is brought to you by Sportland. Quality, integrity, and tradition. We have a call on a bar AC that is not working properly. Now this particular AC has actually been down for a while. What's wrong with it, I don't know. But I know that when I changed that AC, I'd say about a month ago, maybe two months ago, I noticed this AC wasn't working, but it wasn't very hot outside yet. And the customer, I guess, was reluctant to put in a work order. So now all of a sudden, you know, it's getting warm and they need to know what's going on. So we're going to dive into this. They also have a few other AC issues, but we're going to start with this guy. Now, uh, from first glance, this thing's a piece of junk. The panels are broken, you know, all that good stuff. But you're not getting ACs these days, so everything's basically getting approved as far as repairs. So we're going to go through it and see what's up. Open up the electrical section, compressor section. The first thing, I'm like, oh no, there's oil. But no, that's just condensation. Um, definitely old those contactors and everything but I don't see anything jumping out at me as of yet I'm not a fan of the aftermarket condenser fan motors and aftermarket capacitor location but not saying it won't work uh, we come over here to the disconnect switch where we're gonna start and let's go ahead and test voltage so see what we got going on here all right so line one Line two, 204 volts, two to three, 205, one to three, 204. Let's go down to the bottom. 204, 205, 204. So we got good fuses, no problems there. Go across just to make sure nothing, nothing, nothing. So we have um, fuses are fine. Don't see any issues there. Let's go to 24 volts. So we're going to come right here and we're going to check from common to R. And we have nothing, no 24 volts from common to R. So it looks like we got a little circuit breaker right here but it doesn't look like it's popped kind of hard to see but it doesn't look like it's popped let's go to the transformer direct to the transformer right here and we'll go ahead and test here to here we've got no voltage coming out of the transformer and let's verify that we've got voltage going in that guy off that guy off and let's go right here So we have 204 volts going into the transformer. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and shut off the disconnect switch and we're gonna ohm out the transformer. It's low voltage. We'll put our meter on resistance. We're gonna test, test the coil. Yeah, looks like this guy's gonna be a problem here. Let's go here and let's go here. Let's check the top too and see what we got. Yeah, looks like we've got a bad transformer. But before we change the transformer, we'll put it back in so we don't forget how it's wired. And then before we change the transformer, we'll uh, we're gonna chase down a low voltage short. Now these carrier units are notorious for having low voltage shorts on the indoor blower assembly, so we're gonna check that out. Now you don't want to assume this is always the problem, but on these carrier units, a couple places where they commonly short for the low voltage side is pressure controls, okay? Now this one we actually happen to have wired in a way that it's not gonna touch because we used a double zip tie method, but it still theoretically could touch right there. But I don't see any issues. 
All right, we'll clean that up maybe. But just kind of looking up here, it could also be a bad contact or different things like that, right? Circuit board certainly doesn't look the greatest. Um, we come in here. Uh, thermostat wiring, looks like a thermostat wires ran over here. Now one of the more common places for these is when on the original OEM wiring, it runs across the blower assembly like right here. See this, this one, they, they rub out on the top. Now look right here. That could be, uh, doesn't necessarily look like it broke the jacket, but we'll look into it. Uh, my, I'm suspect, that one is a uh, freeze stat, that black wire running up there, and I'm very suspect of that. Freeze stat should be coming through. They're typically wired in series with the uh, low pressure and high pressure. So we'll investigate that guy. That might be our culprit. Look at this uh, limit switch is completely rotted out. That's not good. This thing's a mess. This thing's dirty inside too. Blower assembly has big old chunkers in it. Look at that, just falling out. This guy needs to be cleaned. Dang, dang, Gina. Was it damn Gina? What's that from? Man, did I just date myself. That's a 90s sitcom right there. Um, first person to guess that, send me an email and I'll send you a sticker. If you guess it right what 90s sitcom that's from. All right, um, so we're looking good in there. All right, we're gonna get in here. I'm gonna probably pop the top on the unit and have a look at that uh, free stat. Before I go too crazy, I just came over here to these free stat wires, brought it over here, this is one end of it, and we'll test, uh, test it to ground. And we have a direct short to ground on that low voltage wire. So more than likely that's gonna be the cause of the transformer issue. Now, the next thing is, why did it ruin the transformer and not blow the control fuse? Maybe it did blow the control fuse. Oh yeah, it is blown. Yeah, it's got a burn mark in it. Huh, that's interesting. Why would it ruin the transformer if the control fuse was blown? I'm intrigued by that one. Oh well, anyways, we'll go through it. I thought this was interesting. It's actually not even rubbed out on the top of the blower. I'm not touching any metal until I get all the way over to that evaporator now. It's actually like in the wiring over there somewhere or even the switch itself is shorted. Very interesting. Went ahead and popped the top on the unit, that way I can have a better look. I'll fix all that capacitor stuff. They're lucky. That rubbed out, but it didn't hit a copper line. It went in between the copper lines. It's kind of crazy. Look at like how deep it went, but there's no copper there. That's crazy, crazy nuts. But um, it's kind of a pain in the butt. I wanted to pull this side off, but you gotta get these screws that are back down behind this blower assembly bracket. And it's really hard to get those without moving the blower assembly bracket. But at the same time, we really should clean that blower wheel. So maybe I will do this. Um, before I clean the blower wheel though, because again, this unit needs love, right? But I hate to go down the path of spending three hours cleaning the blower wheel, pulling that out, and then find out we have grounded compressors or something. So let's go ahead and uh, test the compressors, test everything else out as best as possible real quick. Make sure there's no other major issues. Make sure they actually have refrigerant in them. If they do, then we'll proceed with pulling the blower assembly so that way we can get that bracket out. We might as well clean it when we have it out and then we can get in there and change that free step. Man, my allergies, whew, stuff's getting in my nose, man. This thing's dusty. Look at that drain pan too. It's all full of chunkers. So let's pull this guy out right here and all the way down to here and see if we can see. Is that the short? Or is there more to it than that? It could be internally shorted too, who knows? It's somewhere in there though. All right, well, one thing that sucks about these units is when you pull this, that whole blower panel like sags and these things never go back together the same. But we're gonna keep on trucking, pull the blower assembly and then uh, we'll clean this unit up too. It's amazing how quickly you can tear these units down. <laughs> 
once you start pulling things apart. But yeah, we'll get in there and clean that blower, we'll vacuum this area out as best as possible. There's a lot of nastiness. It's not gonna be perfect. It's really polishing the turd, but we'll get that evaporator cleaned up. The evap's not that bad, actually. Um, get this vacuumed out. We're gonna have to shut off the heat because that's all grease and that's a fire hazard. So this uh, unit's gonna need a new heat exchanger before the next heating season. I don't even know if we can get a unit before then, but uh, we'll see. So we'll, we'll disable the heat permanently on this guy um, and then uh, keep on going. What I'm using is the Refrigeration Technologies foam gun with the brightener cleaner. Eventually we'll do the evaporator cleaner. Now, their gun is actually different than everybody else's and it's specifically made, they have a new one, okay? Notice the shape and everything. It's specifically made with the concentration amounts for their cleaners. You see that, you should be getting eight gallons out of that, of cleaner, okay? So you don't just pour this in. And, and another thing too, I think there's a lot of misconceptions. You don't fill this with water. You just put it in there, you set the dilution ratio, and you don't, it doesn't take a lot. Like I have more cleaner than, I have a pretty big amount of cleaner, that's a lot. But we've gotta do the blower assembly, the condensers, the evaporator, like, and normally I don't wanna use this on an evaporator either, but because it's so dirty, we're gonna break it down, rinse it, sanitize it, and then we'll do evaporator cleaner. But we wanna get a lot of this stuff off. We're also gonna start vacuuming and we'll split this condenser while we're at it. But yeah, you wanna make sure, if possible, you're using their cleaner and you wanna make sure you dilute it right. Look at the stuff coming out of the evaporator. I just put a little bit on there, like not even full strength. I'm just kinda, we're not looking for shiny. We're just looking for penetration, drip. I'm gonna give it a rinse with the uh, shower wand. Just kinda working on cleaning the drain pan out first. That's the first thing. Get that draining properly. Look at that gunk coming out. Look at all the chunks of stuff. Um, I also put some on the blower assembly, so we're letting that soak, then we'll give it a rinse too here in a minute. So for those that don't know, pretty much it's safe to say that anything five tons and above, whether it be residential or commercial, has a double road condenser, okay? A lot of people don't even realize that second one's there. I've seen people, no joke, condemn equipment because, you know, oh, the condenser's restricted or something, you know, and they don't realize you can literally just pull the condensers apart and clean them. So we're gonna clean this one. This one isn't horrendous, but it's pretty dirty. So I've seen a lot worse than this, but we'll get in here and uh, get this guy cleaned out real quick. And then once I do that, then I'll switch my chemical over to the evaporator coil cleaner. Cause we got this guy kind of, I got the bulk of the big chunks rinsed out with the brightener cleaner. Um, you wanna be careful about using the brightener cleaner on evaporators too, because the smells and stuff, there's no customers in the building and there won't be for another two hours. So we'll get the evaporator cleaner on there, get it sanitized, and then uh, um, start assembling and putting things back together. Look at how gross the stuff is coming through this guy. Pure mud, pure mud. So what happens is if you wash the outside in, then you just get the stuff, you push it through into the middle of this coil and it gets stuck. And vice versa, if you wash just from the inside in, so the only way to thoroughly clean this coil is from splitting it. I watched a manufacturer's video on Carrier the other day and they were talking about cleaning condenser coils and they said nothing. Well, it was a manufacturer's representative, like a distributor that does YouTube videos and they didn't say anything about splitting a coil. And I think that's something that manufacturers don't do a good job of letting people know because you read installation instructions and it says, oh yeah, just clean it, you know, no big deal. Real short, ice machine manufacturers do that too. They say, oh yeah, our machines only take this much time to clean. It's a lot of baloney because realistically, probably once to twice a year, this condenser needs to be split like this and cleaned. All right, I sprayed evaporator cleaner all over this guy. Now you don't really want to rinse the evaporator cleaner unless you're using it to clean. In this case, I'm using it to sanitize, and then it has enzymes that can help break things down and help inhibit uh, growth and different things like that. So we're gonna leave the evaporative coil cleaner on there. Natural condensation should rinse it, but I am gonna go ahead and rinse out the foam from the drain pan. That way, we're not all foamed up in there. So just kinda working on that, and we're just slowly putting the unit back together. When you're done 
clean up your work area. Get the cleaners and different things off the ground so that way they don't become a problem for the roof. And then also, you rinse all your debris and stuff away from the unit, preferably down the drain. That way it doesn't dry out and then suck back up on the condenser. So nice and slow, just clean your work area, get all this nastiness out of here. Plus it makes it easier to work too. Obviously you gotta be careful because I got a motor right there. So. I'm eliminating the rat's nest of uh, um, wiring and I'm extending these wires, putting heat shrink connectors. That way they can make it all the way into the blower assembly cabinet. We'll do the same thing for the capacitor wires too. Um, and there won't be any wire connections outside of the condenser fan motor assembly. Also, uh, I wasn't able to get a freeze stat, so we're just gonna run without the freeze stat for now. Um, we'll just isolate it and we'll just have high pressure and low pressure controls. So yeah, we'll just eliminate it completely and then we'll wire in the economizer assembly. Um, we're currently, I have someone putting the unit together um, and then once he's ready for me, we'll put the blower assembly, then we'll put the top on very last and then change the transformer and all that good stuff. Blower assembly all put back together, wires, you know, tied in as best as possible. They're not perfect, but these units never are. We made sure we put everything back in, um, put a new transformer in, took the freeze stat out. What the freeze stat was doing was actually just breaking the common to compressor one. It's interesting. Um, so we took that out and then uh, put this jumper common. Um, condenser fan motors are all prepped and ready. I extended the wiring over there. So once we get the top put back on, um, we'll put condenser fan motors back in. I went ahead and got rid of the dual cap that wasn't being used, relocated the capacitors, put new ones up in here. So we're gonna wire direct into the capacitors and hopefully be done with this guy. We are ready to energize, but this thing has been down for a long time. Now, granted, we did vacuum everything out and we cleaned the blower wheel. We have to send someone downstairs and I'm gonna have to bump start it just a little bit at a time because we don't know if this blower is just gonna blow the whole dining room full of dirt. So gotta be careful about that kind of stuff, but we're all in. It's not perfect, it's polishing a turd, but two new capacitors, wiring's all under there, nice and safe. We'll put some zip ties and go from there. Now, um, I sent someone downstairs. We just did this test. I disconnected R so the unit can't turn on, the thermostat can't turn it on. And then I just grabbed this contactor and I slowly, once, stopped for a minute. And then just had someone watching all the vents just to make sure that we weren't getting anything dust blowing out or anything like that. And if you do have dust, you just do it slowly, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. But no dust, everything's fine. So we're gonna continue, hook up R, and then finish troubleshooting the unit. I jumped it out, the indoor fan came on, and both compressors are running. Both condenser fan motors are running. Everything, make sure the fan motors are running in the right direction. They are, everything's running in the right direction. So we're gonna put the panels on, we're gonna let it run for a few minutes, make sure nothing funky happens, then we'll gauge up and check the stages and everything. All right, uh, first stage is looking pretty decent, not seeing any big issues. Um, Subcooling's a little bit high, but it's discharge pressure, so that's not too bad. Superheat's kind of moving around. Don't see any major issues. Temperature split, airflow looks wonky, but I'm not worried about that right now. Um, okay, let's go to circuit two. And let's go back here. So circuit two is looking pretty much the same. I mean, not too bad. We're gonna let that superheat run for a little bit longer. Let's hope it drops down, because that is a little bit high. Um, but I mean, everything's looking pretty much in line here. It's really not that bad. Actually, airflow says it's pretty decent, actually. Yeah, this guy's looking good. I mean, I wanna see that, that second stage superheat come down. I'll let it run for a little bit longer, but um, I'm, I'm not too concerned about this guy at all. It's looking really nice. Although I will say, well, no, that shouldn't affect that. Because we don't have a very big load right now, but that shouldn't be making the superheat that high. Like I said, I'll let it run for a little bit longer. This thing's been running for a little bit, and with that superheat being a little bit high, and that subcooling being as high as it is, I'm not gonna add any refrigerant to this guy. I would suspect that we might have a slight restriction in the, accurator metering device, fixed orifice metering device. 
So I will definitely talk with the customer. Um, there's really no clearing those things. And um, I know people, I've even tried to clear them and I thought I had success, but once you disassemble one and realize what that actuator's made of, two fixed orifices about an inch apart, you think about it, it's almost impossible to actually clear it. Even if you heat it up, you get something through the first orifice, it's gonna get stuck because of the pressure drop, it's like a mess. So, um, there's not much I can do about this right now. Come over here, let's let it run for a minute more on circuit one and see how that superheat drops. We'll give it a second. It's interesting because the first stage is kind of doing the same thing with that high superheat. I don't know if it's a... I mean, with the 21 degree subcooling, huh, that's interesting. The condenser's clean, condenser fan motors are running, indoor blower motor's running and moving as much air as it can. Oh, you know one thing? Let me close the minimum outside air damper and let me get just building air. That could be affecting our uh, targets. So let me do that real quick because that could be messing with us because my pressures look pretty good. So I should clarify that the reason why I closed the outside air damper was to get a more accurate target. Okay, it wasn't going to change the superheat itself. It was just going to change the target. So it dropped the target down to about 7.4. Um, but we're still running high superheat. But here's the thing, we've already got 20 degrees of subcooling. We're already stacking liquid in that condenser. I don't want to put any more gas in this thing. So I'm kind of wondering if we have a plugged up metering device on this guy, on both stages. Um, discharge line temp is decent. Don't see any issues there. I mean, other than that, we're running. The unit's doing pretty good. Um, it's not horrendous. It's just running an elevated suction temperature on both compressors. Suction line temp's pretty much identical, about 60 degrees. So, yeah, there's not really much more we can do on that. Sorry about the line, they're kind of silly. Um, there's not much more I'm gonna do about this. I'm not gonna add any more refrigerant to this. This thing's working about as good as it can be. Uh, we are gonna have ramifications because the higher the normal suction temperature, but we're gonna have to uh, talk to the customer about possibly replacing the evaporator on this, or at least just the metering device, but honestly, it might be easier just to change the whole evap. But um, it's working, the unit's running as hard away. Main problem, bad transformer, um, and uh, bad freeze stat, but I had, you know, cleaned the unit up, got it operational, made it work a lot better than it was. That panel's beat down, but they ain't replacing anything right now because you can't even get these units, so. Yeah, this guy's good. We're gonna wrap this one up. Uh, we're also having a problem with the kitchen AC, so I'll look at that here in just a minute. But yeah, that's it for this one until the customer decides what they wanna do. In the beginning of video, I kinda talked about common places for there to be electrical shorts in these units, right? And it's important to understand that because of experience, I know a lot of places that potential low voltage electrical shorts can happen on these carrier package units, right? Because I've seen them several times over and over and over again. But you wanna be careful not to just assume things just because you've seen it in the past. You always wanna keep that in the back of your mind when you're trying to search for an electrical short and it can give you a guideline as to where to look when you have a hard time but you always wanna to remember to start with the basics, right? Grab your meter, put it on continuity, put it on tone, and start testing things, right? Um, when you're testing transformers, put it on resistance. And I do wanna cover something too. I constantly mess up electrical terms when I'm saying things. Sometimes I'll say, we're gonna test continuity when we're, when we're um, you know, uh, testing resistance or different things like that. And, and I apologize, I am not a legit educator. I'm not formally educated in HVACR. I've just learned from the school of hard knocks, right? A lot of mistakes going to school myself. So I'm not a certified trainer, certified teacher. Okay. Forgive me when I get terms incorrect. It's funny because one time I was at a trade show and I ran into an HVAC teacher and his student was with him and his student wanted to meet me and he had to come over and say his little passive aggressive phrase to me, you know, 
Yeah, you, you have some pretty decent videos, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty good. There's there's some mistakes, though, you know, and, and I'm like, OK, you know, humor. I'm like, can you tell me what my mistakes are? You know, and and he tried, you know, and he's just the instructor was upset because, you know, well, yeah, you know, sometimes you say things incorrectly, the terms and, you know, and it, I, it, the important thing that I think I want to get across on this channel is that we're not perfect. OK, instructors aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. We mess up terms. Of course, we strive to be perfect, right? That's the best you can do is always try to be perfect. But understand, you're never going to reach that level. OK, I never once come across, you know, or never once had an ambition to be, you know, an educator. That's not what I planned on this channel. I have no plans with this. This channel is literally, I, it started as me making videos for my employees and then it's its kind of morphing into something else. But I mean, I'm just consistently doing what I do. And yes, I have ramblings and yes, I have weird erratic, you know, uh, phrases and different things like that. But I just try my best. Okay, so anyways, back to the video. But, you know, don't get stuck in in a in in a routine just making assumptions and just jumping into things right and you may see that in my videos but also understand again that my mind is working say, thinking things that maybe i might not be verbalizing sometimes okay so yes i realize that some of my phrases are incorrect and my terms are incorrect and i apologize i try to be better because i do recognize like hey you know when i'm in editing a video i'm like i oh, yeah, i didn't actually say that right but instead of editing the mistakes out, I actually leave them in because I want people to realize that I'm human. I'm not a robot. I'm not perfect, okay? I am just like everybody else. I really am, okay? It's really hard for me. I get like an imposter syndrome thing because, you know, if I get praise or something and you know, whatever, and people say, you know, oh, you're, so, you're great at this or whatever, I, it's hard for me to recognize that because in my eyes, I'm just a service technician. It's still baffling to me that all of you guys want to watch these videos. It really does baffle me because these are just the ramblings of my brain. Like, I'm not going out there rehearsing content and coming up with a script. You're literally hearing me walk up on a job start and start talking to myself. Like, and that's how, if I wasn't making YouTube videos, that's how I troubleshoot anyways, is I, I talk to myself. That's how my thought process works, okay? Um, sometimes it's verbally and vocal, sometimes it's in my head, but that's how I troubleshoot, all right? So don't get stuck in a rut, don't go in making assumptions. You always wanna make sure that you're remembering to follow, fall back to the basics and troubleshoot accordingly, okay? So we found an electrical short on this unit. I was not able to source a freeze stat. So I went ahead and pulled the freeze stat out of the picture. Now that's not ideal. It isn't, but I needed to close this ticket out because I, I'm just so crazy right now with work. I didn't have time to order a freeze stat and have to wait weeks or whatever it is to get one. Um, so I, I, I disconnected the freeze stat from the picture, but we still have low pressure, high pressure safety. So I'm confident we're gonna be okay with that. Um, going through the unit, just basic troubleshooting. I want to stress because I did put it as the teaser is about splitting condenser coils. Now I want to make it clear, right? I have preventative maintenance contracts set up with a couple of my customers, not all of them, but a couple of them and nowhere in my preventative maintenance contracts do we split coils. Okay. Customers don't want to pay for that on a routine basis. Hence why the metering device was plugged up on this unit. Okay. Nobody out there wants to pay for a perfect preventative maintenance. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. You get into like institutional work, hospitals, government work. They actually sometimes do pay decent for preventative maintenance and they want to follow root, you know, schedules, especially hospital work because they're held to a higher standard by different um, governing bodies. And, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. But for the most part in the retail and restaurant space, there's nobody out there doing a perfect preventative maintenance. Now there's customers that go above and beyond what normal other customers do like this particular one. And they have me do a monthly maintenance at their location. But that monthly maintenance does not include having two people there pulling the top off the unit, splitting a condenser on a regular basis. It just doesn't happen in a perfect world. Every six months, uh, three, you know, at least twice a year in a perfect world, you should be splitting a condenser and cleaning the inside of it. But 
let's be practical. Most people aren't, but I think it's important for technicians to understand that it needs to be done. I can tell you the beginning of my career, I can remember some train package units that I would clean. And it's like, man, you just, the, the head pressure on the second stage was just so high and you could never get it figured out. You'd recover the charge, weigh it back in, still have high head pressure. Must be a restriction in the condenser. Must be a bad condenser. It wasn't, it was a dirty inside coil. Okay. Um, and I didn't know what I was doing. It took me a long time to realize that there was two rows. And so once I figure this knowledge out, I try to share it from the mountaintop, right? I'm trying to tell everybody you need to split a condenser and that goes for residential too. And I said five tons and above, and actually you might see it on three and four ton units now in residential. I'm talking about a standard residential split system. You got to split that condenser. You don't just clean it from the inside out. You got to pop the top. You got to pull it off separate the condensers and clean it. I actually just did my own. Mine's a four ton unit at my house. It's a, a 14 sear, four ton R22 split system and had to pull the top off the unit. It's a pain in the butt. Had to separate the condensers, clean the inside row. So we as technicians need to do a better job, okay? We need to understand and better ourselves and educate ourselves, read technical documentation. And I'm saying this to you because I did not do it. As a new technician coming into this trade, I did not start realizing these things. I made mistakes and I realized I can, that, that feeling in my stomach the first time I pulled the top off of an air conditioner and I saw that it was a double road condenser and I saw how dirty it was, it was like, whoa, flat, you know, just like, boom, all these images popped in my head of how many times, you know, oh my gosh, I didn't know, you know, now in all fairness, like I mentioned in the video too, manufacturers do not do a good job of educating technicians on how to work on their equipment. They don't. Okay. Yes. If you take a carrier training class or a train training class or a Linux training class, insert any name of manufacturer, Manitowoc, ice machines, whatever. If you go to their full service schools, yeah, they might mention it in a service school, but they never mention it in regional trainings or online videos or anything like that. If you look at manufacturers trainings for, uh, or manufacturers representatives for carrier, for Linux, for whoever, if you look at their videos, when they tell you how to clean a condenser, they do not properly tell you how to clean a condenser. And I could be incorrect. And I would challenge you guys. If one of you guys has a manufacturer's video or training material that actually tells you how to properly clean a condenser, I'd be really interested in seeing that because I personally have not seen it. So if you guys have that content, if you have links to manufacturers, documentation that tells you how to properly split a condenser coil, send it to me, uh, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I want to know. I'd love to know. I'll give that manufacturer props, but my experience is not any of them do. I actually find it a personal challenge and it's kind of fun for me. Whenever I go to ice machine training classes, I love to see a full classroom and to hear the representative that's up there training on the ice machines and have them, you know, spout the, 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 the sales, spiel about how easy their ice machines are to clean. I love being in those classes and getting to be that passive aggressive ass. Yeah, that's where I'm going to go. The passive aggressive ass um, in the class that chimes up and just starts leading them into these questions. I love doing that. It's so fun because it irritates me that manufacturers don't do this, right? So I'll lead them into a question. I'll start asking little questions. Hey, so, you know, then this and that. And then I get to the point where finally, the it's it's so fun to do this. The manufacturer will finally say, well, yeah, you know, uh, three to four times a year, you're going to have to do a full teardown on this ice machine. And then I'll, I'll, I'll like lead them into these questions to get them to admit it in front of everybody in the class that, yeah, a proper cleaning on an ice machine takes four to six hours per ice machine, like to do a thorough cleaning. They never say that in any of their documentation. Never. They all just have the sales stuff because they want to sell ice machines. They want to sell air conditioners. They want to sell refrigerators. And in order to sell things, they need to give consumers points that make them want to go with their product. And so they're all just saying, oh yeah, our ice machines are really easy to clean. You just push the clean button and walk away and it'll automatically turn back on when it's done. That's not cleaning an ice machine. That's doing a a, a, a monthly rinse, you know? Same thing with the air conditioning uh, manufacturer's representative that I just watched, and they were like, yeah, you know, you just clean the condenser from the inside and the outside. Uh, they mentioned nothing about splitting the coils. 
That's that's sales talk because they're trying to sell how good their machine is, right? And don't get me wrong, there's good things about all air conditioners, but one thing to understand when it comes to air conditioners, refrigerators, ice machines, is that they take time to maintain. And proper maintenance is gonna cost the customer money. We need to do a better job as an industry of getting the customer on the same level as us and understanding that routine maintenance is expensive, very expensive, okay? But 10 years, 15 years down the line or five years down the line, a new condenser is a lot of money, right? And a new compressor is a lot of money. And a plugged up accurator metering device on these carrier package units is a lot of money. And how much was it going to cost to do routine maintenances that could have avoided that? You know, so enough of my rambling about manufacturers misleading consumers. OK, so um, obviously there's a bunch of different stuff out there that we can use to maintain and manage our equipment. OK, understanding in our brains the best way to clean things in a perfect world. The customer changes this equipment. Right. But. That's not practical. It's not cost effective. I get so many comments on my videos. I can't believe you put a compressor in that. You're doing the customer a disservice. Shut up. Okay. My customers are given options. Hey, it's going to cost this much to repair. I'm always trying to push a new you know, package unit to a customer or something like that. First off, in these times right now, it's really hard to get package units. Second, in California, and oh my gosh, the internet's going to go crazy with, yeah, you shouldn't live in California, blah, 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 shut up, okay? Um, in California, there's there's a good things and bad things about living here. The weather's the, the main thing, okay? The seasons, our winter is 50 degrees, okay? That's, that's not even cold. We don't know what cold is here. We know what hot is, though, okay? Um, but uh, ironically, I, I love the term, there actually is no cold, okay? There's only absence of heat. That's, that's a whole, I, I love that little spiel. That's a fun one that makes me kind of laugh inside. But um, it's very expensive to change equipment here because of safety reasons, of the permitting process and different things like that. So it's safe to say that whatever a package unit costs, okay, whatever I pay for it, it's going to cost the customer three times as much on the simplest change out because if you're going to pull permits and different things like that. And it can sometimes cost the customer four times as much depending on how many hoops the, they have to jump through to properly permit that job. If their building's not up to code, different things like that. It's a nightmare. So customers usually opt to repair. That's why they fix this stuff. So, you know, I just do my best. I give the customer the options. I let them make the decisions, okay? And... They make the decisions majority of the time. I'd say 90% of the time the customers are fixing the equipment rather than replacing the equipment. Hey, I give them the options. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm saying, hey, it's going to be this much to fix. I'm going to say it's this much to replace. And you guys make the decision, okay? Sometimes the customers replace. Sometimes they don't, you know? So I'm just here to be a technician, to share the ramblings in my head with you guys. Um, it is really cool and humbling to get the support from you guys. It's awesome to see the comments, the emails, the different things like that. So thank you so very much. It's really, really cool. I really appreciate you guys making it to the end of the video. Um, do me a favor. Let me know in the comments if you actually made it to the end. It's really, really cool. Okay, so thank you so very much. Remember to be kind to one another. We don't know what the next person's going through. Times are crazy right now. We need more kindness. We truly do. Okay, so be kind to one another. I really appreciate you and uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?